here to introduce Katie, who's doing a talk on how to be an artist. She has her BFA, MFA, and has had her art hello, featured all over Canada and in the US. And she's been featured in Pottery Barn, Crate and Barrel, magazines like Better Home and Garden. And she's been featured in, um, her art's been featured in TV shows like The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and How to Be Single. <laughs> And uh, she also has a consulting business, and you can meet with her online or in person to discuss your art, any challenges and questions you have, and advice you can seek. Mm -hmm. And she is here to talk about how to break out of the box, things differently, mm -hmm. um, and you don't necessarily have to have a degree to become an artist. No, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. that's a good point. <laughs> I quite um, enjoy that. I will just say no if I'm not ready to answer that or if it's going to be coming up, I'll answer it later. Um, I am going to talk about how to be an artist, but kind of as I walk you through my career path, really burning to know today. Like, make sure that I cover X. Does anyone have anything that they really want to know about? Yeah. How do you get your work in magazines? Okay. Yeah. Well, you definitely talked about that. Yeah. Other questions? Where'd you get that jacket? Oh, this, I got it at the store. And it's tied to a painting, and it actually has paint from one of the paintings you're going to see today. But you have to look very closely to find the paint on the jacket. So, um, okay, this is not my computer, so we'll, we'll see it's all going to work. So, this is like the close note, um, you know, trying to impress you all my stuff that I do. So, I went to three different art schools. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about all of them. I've taught at three different schools. Uh, two that I went to and one that was a private school. Um, I used to recruit students for Emily Connor, so I would like go to New York and Toronto and Montreal and look at hundreds of portfolios until my eyes bled. Um, I worked at five galleries, including the Vancouver Art Gallery and the Kelowna Art Gallery. And I was a curator of the Lake Country Art Gallery, which is a very young, hip happening gallery in Lake Country, which is in the Okanagan, which is halfway between Vernon and Kelowna. So um, that was super fun. I've done four artist residencies. I'm going to talk to you about one in particular. Um, I used to run the Arts Council of the Central Okanagan for two years. I was their executive director. I've had my own art consulting boutique since 2003, uh, 2013. Uh, mostly because people just kept always asking me questions. And I went, I should pay for, make them pay for this. So that's how that started. Um, I've run three online art spaces. I'm going to be starting a fourth. You're going to get the first announcement ever of it today. Um, I've done a lot of pop up galleries, um, organized artist gatherings. Many of these who are here today are part of our artist gathering group here in the Comox Valley. Um, very happy to be making a living from my art, which is very amazing. I'll tell you, I will answer as many questions as you want about money. Anything you want to know. Um, and as my introduction said, I've had my work for sale at major retailers, period of paper magazines, and you can see my work um, at Unbridled, which is a beautiful shop downtown Courtney. Um, and here's some of the newest work. So this is from a body of work called the Engagement Paintings, and these were paintings that I kind of think of as like kind of mantras for a thing. So I started the painting out. And then something like a word or a phrase will come to me, and then the painting is kind of, the thought for me is like the painting in your home, maybe it's an affirmation of your marriage, your love for your partner, or something like that. So uh, this is a new series I've been working on. Um, new palette for me as well. This, this is a little bit overexposed, but you know, please look on my website or Instagram or anything like that to get the color a little bit better. Um, like they said, they're 48 by 36. And they're all um, washed on canvas. So pretty much everything after like 2007, 2009 is going to be wash. I have totally converted. I don't use anything else. That's it. And for those of you who don't know what gouache is, gouache is kind of a in between an acrylic and a watercolor. So if you look back to advertising in the 1940s before it all became computerized and stuff, 
You know those beautifully hand illustrated ads? That's what the wash was. So that really nice matte kind of velvety kind of look and stuff. Um, okay. So you look too young to have done all of that. We must have started really early. Um, I guess so. Or maybe you're just telling me I look really young. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always just been a bit of a go-getter. Um, and this like this stuff to me is really fun. So I just kind of and for a long time. Um, building my resume was a bit of a game to me until I got old and a little more cranky and started saying no to things. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of things that I seem to think that people think artists do, and it goes something like this. So, um, you know, you prep your work, you stretch the canvas, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you sketch, plan, research, look for inspiration. You make the art. You exhibit the art. You sell it. And you start again. So to me, this is a very um, basic idea that I think a lot of artists operate on, and I think that they're missing half of the puzzle. Like making the art is just one part. And I really think that artists are citizens and um, should be connecting with the world. I think that we're connectors and communicators in a really important way. Um, and I think that artists pay attention to the world in ways that other people do not. And I think sometimes that is lost on some artists. Um, and also, here's a whole bunch of other things that I think artists can do. And if you guys want to be cheeky and put up your hand and say you do it, or if you just want to sit quietly and notice which things you're doing, which things you're not, totally fine. So, how many of you readers learn about art, techniques, history, concepts? Well, go to gallery. Anyone who's gone to see the latest Seabag show? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Artist Talks. So you're at an artist talk! <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> uh, you spend uh, time with other artists or visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, you get feedback on your work. And you give feedback to other artists. When they ask. <laughs> <laughs> when they ask, yeah. Or you're just like, hey, is that? Or that's yeah. really great. Uh, <laughs> you give back to the community or support your fellow artists. Post your work to social media, so Instagram, Facebook, that kind of stuff. Send out updates to your email list. Have an email newsletter list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it going to show this last one? Have a website. So, like these last things, especially, you start to get kind of into like the business side of art. But as you can see, all of these things are really important. And my thing that I always come back to, especially when artists are around, like, how do I make it? My thing is always, I always say to them, well, how are you paying attention to the art world around you? How are you engaging with it? Because in my books, intention begets attention. So this is why I've done so many things, is because I'm always like fingers into everything and trying to be like, what's going over there? What's going over there? And so because I'm interested in other people, when opportunities come up, they come to me because they remember how excited I was about whatever they were doing. All right, so question to ask yourself throughout this talk, how are you showing up in the world as an artist? I'm gonna to talk to you about how I've done it, but just have this in the back of your head as you go through. So one of the first ways I ever showed up as an artist is like one of my oldest art pieces that my parents framed when I was in like grade four or five. And the revolutionary thing for this piece was Realizing that animals' back legs bend the opposite way that people's back legs do, and that therefore you have to draw them differently. And I show this to you because I think that every artist needs to make a study of your own practice. So noticing why you're doing things, when things are changing, why are you feeling grumpy about something, why, where, when, or why are you shooting towards a new idea or a new direction. Um, and these are three questions I think you should ask yourself. What, how, and why. And this comes from, uh, if any of you are familiar with um, Simon Sinek, there's a really great TED talk with him. I would definitely recommend um, answering this. I think that these questions are really, really important because if you can answer all of these questions, you're gonna be able to talk to anyone about your art. You're gonna be able to write for your website, for your social media, for your grants, for your proposals, for your artist statement, like anything. Um, and also, it's just gonna help you understand 
where you're going better. Like if you understand what you're on about, it's gonna make it more satisfying to you. It's also just gonna make it clearer and more exciting. What was the name for the TikTok? Um, Simon Sinek, and I'm gonna, um, if you guys, at the end I can email you all the resources and everything okay. else. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so the first school I went to was Okanagan University College, which is now UBC Okanagan. And this is one of uh, the few things I still have pictures of. Excuse me, and this was a first year exercise where you take the picture on the left and you then have to abstract it twice. And so make it less representation and less representation. I also had a really big kick of realism when I was in art school. Like in my second year, I really like got into like, can I, re can I do figurative work? Can I draw the face? I, you know, one of our projects we had to do a portrait of our parents, <laughs> so I had to do these portraits of my parents. Um, my parents finally got rid of it, but they did hang it above their bed for many years. <laughs> so that was good. Um, and then I had did a lot of uh, mixed media as well. And so a question, funnily enough, that I answered for myself in my second year, I still remember the exact moment um, I was driving my way to school. It was, who do you make art? And for me, I make art for myself. And I think, again, it's a really incredibly important question. Because if you don't know who you're making art for, you kind of get swayed by the winds of opinion. And um, if you follow this guy, we'll see how many times I mentioned Seth Godin, who I love. Um, and uh, if you're interested at the end, I'll send you a really fantastic interview he did with an illustrator named Andy J. Pizza, where he talks a little question about, he thinks it's kind of ignorant if artists don't know who you're making your art for. Um, and really, the perfectly great answer is yourself. And that's who I make art for. Like, I don't really care about what anyone else, like, yes, I care what other people think, but really, I make art for me, and for my delight, and my satisfaction. So, you know, I really, I think that that's the answer to the question for anyone, but it may be different, um, a little bit different or deeper. And it may also lead into this question, why do you make art? So, you know, you may be making art as an investigation, you may be making art as an engagement with beauty, you may be make, making art um, just as a mastery, like maybe you're just interested in kind of technique and that kind of thing. Um, and for me, I make art for a few reasons. So one of them is I really love that flow state when you lose sense of time, you lose, lose sense of self, and you have those moments of surprise and kind of like zen-like communion and also you've made this thing. Like, I'm a junkie for that, right? Like, that's why I make art. Um, I also make it for surprise and for play as well. Um, and I really think the answers to these questions is what separates the amateurs from the pros. Because if you ask people who are kind of just earlier on their artistic journey, this kind of question isn't being answered and even then, you know, maybe there's been artists who have been practicing for a really long time, but they've never actually pushed themselves to that next level, where there is actually a deeper investigation into what they're doing. And I've been thinking about a lot um, as I talk to different artists about the difference between like professionals and amateurs. And I think that this might be the line. Like, where is there a sense of investigation or exploration? Um, and I think if that's not there, then to me that's not a satisfying. And I kind of go, well, why, you know, then you're, that's great that you're making it, but like, why? Like, what's the big why? Um, so I did my BFA at um, Emily Carr University of Art and Design. So I did my first two years in the Okanagan, and I went to Emily Carr. Um, two very different programs. The Okanagan was much more about materials, and I get to Emily Carr, and it's much more about the concept. So this is the kind of work I was making when I first got in there. It's not a great picture. Um, and I was working with the ideas of like, first of all, also I had to have concepts in all of my work. So this was talking a lot about kind of stratification and kind of geological time and things Did like that. Did you say you could have concepts or you had to have concepts? You had to have you concepts. Had to have. Like I had never been asked to kind of say like, here I made this and they're like, well what's it about? And I went like, oh, okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me get back to you. And then I started making work like this and luckily, Eventually, I started to um, found the old adage, form follows function. And so the form is actually the content. But it took me a really long time to get over it because 
what were the values that drive you, your work? Oh, there you go. Anyway, um, part of what happened for me was I went from here to here, and I was worried that this work was not enough work. It was not enough labor. It didn't take long enough. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't the battle that it was for other kind of work. And when I talk and I work with artists in, in consulting, the idea we often run into the values and beliefs that drive people's practices, you know? And some people, the work is totally about labor. Like I had a friend in grad school who cut out all the periods from a book and then just, you know, easily pasted them into one page. And that was her work and it took for her forever. But labor was a very important part of her practice. So as I came into this kind of work, it took me a while to get over like, is this valid? Is this okay? Because I wasn't sure that it was enough work. Um, so then I went to do my MFA in Guelph, Ontario. Um, the attraction for me in this program was that I wanted to go out east because in Vancouver, um, I had, had a couple faculty members who were painting painters, and they all came from the east, and they kept telling me about Toronto, 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 Toronto. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll head out that direction. So I entered my MFA with the plan of like, I wanted to kind of dig around my practice and take it apart and put it back together. And so one of the first things to go was the opacity. So if you look back at the old work, all of the marks were opaque and you couldn't kind of see the painter's hand. So I didn't leave any trace of like, here's the lines that the paintbrush made, here's where my hand wobbled or anything like that. And then I went into here and that that was probably the most striking change that started out was making things transparent. So now they're active um, and they have drips and you can see my hand in the work. Here's another one. And also just working on different ways of constructing images. So these are all um, shapes that I would then radi out, radi uh, one shape, so let's say the diamond shape in the center. And then I would radiate out following a certain set of rules in the yellow going up, and I would radiate in the purple going out left, and I would radiate out with a certain rule going out in the green. And I still continue to work this way predominantly, where I'm always working with systems. And if any of you follow Saul Witt, or artists of that ilk, where they make systems so that you say, if you do this, and you just follow it, that's what creates the artwork. And to some extent, that's how I work as well, where I make a set um, of guidelines that I follow that then generate the work, which is how I introduce play and surprise into my work. Because I go, okay, well, if I follow the yellow up, what shape is that going to make? Well, I don't really know. Um, so I also took this on to big wall work. I did maybe about 10 different murals when I was in grad school, and I was really interested in kind of the, the authority of lines and how, you know, um, I had some pieces where I would draw something into the corner, and depending on where you were standing, either the wall would assert itself and the image would look funky, or if you stood in the right place, the dimensionality of the corner disappeared and the image looked flat. So I was really interested in the power that these lines could have over space. So this is um, the first semester of my second year. I'm getting ready to start to think about my thesis project. And so taking the murals, but now wanted to, I was, was going to do was, I was going to paint my whole studio. So I painted my whole studio white. But I needed to make these maquettes first in order to imagine. So when you um, fold all these walls up, it recreates the studio because I couldn't quite figure out like how the lines would progress because um, this one, for example, so the rule for this one is to take that yellow shape, which is the outline of the floor plan, and then just turn it and turn it and turn it and turn it a bunch of times. And so what I was really interested in was the fact that these dimensions, when in their proper space, fit perfectly. And you move it just a tiny bit, and now the line runs up the wall, and it seems to be uncontained by the space that makes it. Um, so here's some shots of my thesis project. Um, it was really, it was a really interesting project. So I remember when I was doing my defense and I was sitting in that room, I didn't like that the painting was behind me. Like I didn't like that I kept, like I could never consume it with my vision in its entirety. So I actually liked the pictures better than I really liked 
the insulation, but funnily enough, this building got torn down, so the mural got torn down with it as well. Which I, at the time, I remember like, I should buy a webcam and put it in the building, and then like, capture the distraction, but that seemed like too much work. Um, and this was another painting that I made. I'm just gonna show it you now, because you're gonna see this painting come up a lot, and you're gonna see how this painting um, has influenced where I've gone since. So the kind of career I was groomed for, so when you go to art schools in Canada, you know, they were, uh, especially the, the programs that I went to, and the teachers that I was mentored by, and kind of the colleagues and friends that I associated with and kind of aspired to be the most, was to have a career where, you know, you teach, and then you have exhibitions, and you know, you make money from grants. So that was kind of, so this is me trying to do this. This is a show at the Vernon Art Gallery in 2013. Here's some of the pieces of work. So these pieces were all done by pooling the gouache and then building it up in layers. And then the green is actually an oil around it because I wanted there to be a little bit of a difference in how the two um, portions of the painting read. It's not as apparent here. Another one, so like the cloud is gouache and then the, the soft pink is all oil. Um, another painting I had at the Lake Country Art Gallery. And these are some water paintings. I made a lot of water paintings for a lot of years. Um, and I worked in blue for like six or seven years straight. Um, and when I've been asked before, like, why blue? Um, and we were talking about it a little bit last night with some friends. Um, I really like that blue, like the pigment can get so dark. Like if you use yellow or green or something like that, you wouldn't be able to get the depth that blue gets. Um, and so that's why it's been kind of the attraction to me is that you can both take it really deep where it kind of disappears, not into black, but into a dark something. Um, and then it can become so light at the same time. So I did a residency in the Bank Center for the Arts in 2011. And I went there to make the, the bright colored cloud work. But if for any of you have been to Banff and tried to make art there, like you go, oh my God, Mountains, streams, you know, like it's just, they kind of take over. So, um, yeah, I think this work is what started first. Um, this is a, uh, called the Bow River Suite, and I remember as I was driving, I just noticing the color of the Bow River. Um, and I took lots of pictures, and I really wanted to do something with it, but I couldn't quite figure out what. And then somehow I stumbled into this monochromatic approach where all I'm doing is taking my pictures and I'm tracing them. So there, there's this very meditative practice. And every panel I would make, I'd be excited at the beginning, be bored out of to tears in the middle, and then I'd get to the end and I'd be so excited that I would start another one. <laughs> so, um, so I love these pieces because they are just lines, but when you come up close, you see the lines, but when they come up back, back, back far away, like they become very photographic, where they are very graphic. and so. I, I really, you know, was so lucky to have stumbled upon this fairly simple kind of means of making something that is actually quite complicated in viewing. And so I'll just go back to these other ones too, because this is a similar body of work where um, these are night mountains. So in Banff there's that, or even here, anywhere where it's a nice clear sky, and that moment where the mountains go from having definition to going to silhouettes, like just as all that definition goes, and then you have the color of the sky, and all you're really aware of is that line between the sky and the top of the mountain. So that's what these paintings were all about, was capturing that top line. And then the operation, like to me, I think that these are beautiful, but to me as the maker, they're dead simple. I draw the top line and then I follow the line down all the way. But because of the magic of paint, because of the magic of color, the magic of pigment on paper, um, they start to have a lot more activity. And so, yeah, so this was a really about finding simplicity that was complicated. And this, this is when the blue, my blue period started. Yeah. Can you talk about the, the like the, the spiritual dimension of the mountain, say, like the symbol of it, or just maybe your experience with in that particular place from that perspective? Well, maybe, maybe this won't be a spiritual answer, but I was really fascinated. Like, all of this body of work is like, I've really, interested in this idea of like tracing into the landscape and try to capture 
the landscape. And I know I can't hike, well, I could hike up to the top of those mountains, mm -hmm. but then I won't be able to consume them with my vision, right? And so to me, it was kind of this strange trying to, way of trying to capture that mountain by tracing it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, um, and for me, the meditation and the spirituality of my practice is always in the making. It's always about making these kind of simplistic means of creating an image. So I go, okay, I'm going to make these ones. I'm going to trace the image until it's done. Um, because it's a very, fairly straightforward kind of operation, I can get into a very zen kind of state where all that I'm thinking about is, well, actually, no, usually I'm thinking about TV shows and music and conversations and like <laughs> anything that I'm painting. And I'm having a moment where I'm just very peaceful and really enjoy, enjoying myself. Um, so to, to kind of to recap the kind of you know career I was groomed for, so to exhibit regularly, um, minimal participation in the market, um, you know, so you're relying on money either from teaching or grants, um, and maintaining artistic integrity. This this to me seems to always be the crux of like where you're selling out, you're not selling out. You know, like did you maintain your artistic integrity? Um, and like, I really bought into all of this stuff. Like, I like to be successful, so when I encounter a model where they say, if you do this, you will be successful, I go, okay, great, I'll go do it. But I, you know, I went and did it and went, ah, this kind of bugs me, I don't really like applying for shows or anything like that. So I'm gonna talk to you now about the career I have now. Yes? I have a quick question as a total non-artist. Yeah. How do you know what your artistic integrity is? Well, if you go to art school, they'll tell you <laughs> what it is. Um, well, the other thing, too, is like, depending on kind of like what, what kind of slice of the art world you encounter. Um, because even if we look at this community here, there's going to be groups of people that think one thing is artistic integrity, and there's going to be another group that thinks this is artistic integrity, and there's going to be another group, and they all think that each other is totally wrong. Right? And so you just have to figure out where you fit. And so I, so for me, as I'm going to talk about where I've gone, it's always been this dance of like, which, which of the values and beliefs that I got from my formal art education am I going to keep? And which am I going to go like, go away, like I don't need to feed you anymore, that's like elitist garbage that, you know, I can pretend to be, but I'm not going to be anymore. But maybe I will if I'm talking to someone who's like part of that world, but maybe I will. <laughs> so it's kind of this fun kind of like trickster thing. So um, this painting here up on the couch, so this is um, part of a story about art licensing. And art licensing is when, um, fortunately in Canada, whenever you make artwork, you automatically own the copyright for that artwork. And because you are the copyright owner, it allows for you to rent out your intellectual property. So art licensing is basically when a company comes to me and says, Katie, we really love your work. We want to have your work at Craig and Barrow. Um, we'd like to license your image from you. So this is the very first piece that I had with Craig and Barrow um, back in, it, it started, like the conversation started in 2011, but it didn't actually get into production until 2012. And that's what this guy in the coach there. Um, so this has been a really interesting journey. So these are the two, to the pieces from the Banff series. This is at William Sonoma Home, their New York store. There's only two William Son Sonoma stores in the United States, one in California and one in New York. So I happened to be in New York one time and I got there and I got a picture of it and I was like, yeah, all right, what's up? Um, so, so is it like a recording where every time they reproduce it, you get a percentage of bingo. that? Okay. So it's kind of like how, if you have an understand, well, some idea of like maybe how radio works, right? Every time you play a song, the artist gets some money. Well, here is the same thing. Anytime you see my work that is a print, I made some money from it. Yeah. So how do you get past the idea? Like, I really like doing the original work, and yeah. I'm stuck with that. Like, it took every ounce of my energy to do a card series, and I can't get past that because I like the originals. Like, I don't know why. <coughs> and so, sorry, your cards. Are you making reproductions of Just, your originals? Uh, uh, like I, I. Ask for post and I can't like cards oh. as far as I want to go with it. Like I just want to make originals. Like that's part of my values yeah. that I, I like. I don't know if other artists feel that way, but I prefer the originals. Mm -hmm. So and so like my sense.
this would be like you would need some deeper in exploration there. You're probably going to have to talk about, yeah, all the values and beliefs about what original means to you, why it's better than something else. Fortunately for me, <laughs> that's not an issue. Um, yeah, yeah, we definitely a bigger conversation to unpack, but you know, so that's probably, um, you know, somewhere around, somewhere along the way, you've picked up some ideas about what original artwork means. And so figuring out where, what those ideas are, where or how did you pick them up, maybe who said them to you, because sometimes who says it to you and if like, they're in a position of authority in your life, it's gonna like glue to you like nothing else, right? And you're never gonna be able to pry it off until like someone says like, do you notice that you have like a big star teaching? You'll be like, oh my God, no, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and these are the kinds of questions that I, that I love and I think that um, every artist should be asking themselves for sure. Um, so here, kind of continuing with some of the um, line work that you saw from the banquets, this is a residency I did at UBC Okanagan, and this was for a big commission I had for a restaurant group out of the States called Bonefish Grill. And here, the top paintings, you can see where the jacket ties in. <laughs> so when I, when, I had, when I was doing these pieces, I had this like draped over a uh, stool, so I was always like checking the colors and being like, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, two, the top two pieces ended up going to the restaurant, the one I still have um, at my place. I have a question about that. Yeah. So, did they commission those directly from you? Yeah. And so, what would motivate a restaurant to do that when they could potentially buy a reproduction of, a, of an artwork? For so, part of this, so this, the, the agreement with these guys was, like, they had something like, 200 to 500 locations. So what they were doing was they were commissioning original work that we would then license and print for their 200 to 500 locations. So they were both purchasing original work from me and then they were gonna license the use of that original work to furnish all their other locations. And where would they have found you? Magic. <laughs> I hate to say it, but like I have a very magical online life and things pop up like out of nowhere. So like the licensing to me came out of an email one day where someone's like, hey, we saw your work somewhere. And I'm like, I had a crappy little website, but it tells you how important websites are. That, you know, someone's like, hey, we found your work. We think it's great. Do you want to do this thing with me? And uh, so were they yeah. Googling a certain type of artwork? Or did like you those, ever find out how? Well, no, I should, I don't, like, you know, and I'm in contact with the woman who it ruins the started magic. this off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't, That's you know. true. I do, right? That's not true. I do. And I like, totally part of it for me, too, like, why I think licensing works so well for me is because I like the magic of this thing. And because I, originality doesn't really mean that much to me. And I think it's kind of funny and titillating that my work is, like, popping up all over the place. And, like, you know, whereas other people would be like, I want control, like, no, it can't go there, and it can't, you know, like, no. Other people would freak out, and I'm like, oh, yeah, cool, okay. You know, so, like, that's where your values and beliefs about what you believe about your work is gonna guide whether or not something like this will work for you or not. So did you have the freedom to decide on this, or did they come to you and say, we want blue and white with a bit of They said they wanted some abstract work, and then we had, you know, some back and forth where I kind of said, Here's some ideas. I said, okay, do things like this. Here's this. They had the size requirement that they that they already wanted. Okay. Um, yeah. So every restaurant looks the same. Oh, so if you want the dirty down and dirty on this one. <laughs> so what happens was I send the work in. I don't hear back for a month. My contact finally comes back to me and says, like, can you phone me? And I'm like, okay. And she is an architect. Never works with artists. Is really scared to have to tell me. So here's what happened. We got a new brand director who said, we want to do a focus group. So we do a focus group. The focus group's answer is, how do we know it's a fish restaurant if there aren't fish on the walls? So basically, now the brand director's checked the whole direction of this project, but because I took like six months to write this contract with some of their people that said that they must accept the work, I still got paid, and they still have to take extra work on top of it, and I don't know what they did with the work, or it made it to any locations, but I got taken care of. So just, you know, dotting your I's and T's, like, well, don't dot your T's, cross them. <laughs> um, There's fish all in there. There's yeah. Um, so here's where the line work kind of starts to come back. Um, 
where that blue piece kind of showed you before. Um, so these, this is my work in a few different places where it's popped up. Um, oh, okay, yes, okay, I'm gonna come back to this. So here's what my career looks like now. I did it once in a while, and I will be honest, I am really struggling with the idea of exhibiting at all right now. I think it's too much work um, for, I don't know about the feedback. Mm -hmm. Which you never, which you never hear her to say, right? And I'm going like, putting a show together too. Yeah, the time, the energy, and I'm just going like, I don't know if it's for me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm um, participating in the market fully. Um, no grants. I actually made a decision quite a number of years that I wasn't going to write any grants anymore. Um, if you follow Daniel Laporte at all, there was a really great exercise in this, this book which led to this decision where she said, what would you say no to if there was no consequence? And I was like, no more grants. So I don't write grants. And I think partially, because I do believe in magic, that if I've said no to grants, money must come to me some other way. And so it does. Um, and then I have artistic integrity in conversation with design and market forces. So let me take you on the journey of this painting. So here's that painting from before. This was like just a kind of an ad hoc painting I made in grad school. Um, I didn't like, just seemed like to be its own discreet little thing that I didn't think would go anywhere. Well, it just keeps popping up everywhere. Everyone loves it. It's super popular. Um, yeah. Um, oh, and here's the, here's the screenshot. I'm watching movies, I'm going, oh my god, okay, quick, quick, get a screen capture. So here's the pieces from, from that one. So the secret, I will share with you about where these things come from. Do you remember these maquettes that I made? These are panels from those maquettes that I just cut up. And so to me, again, the trickster me is like, ha 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 ha, someone's paying me for my crappy grad school maquettes. And they're going bananas, <laughs> right? So like they ended up here, they ended up on Kitty Schmidt, they go all over the place. So part of what's happened now is I've been shown that the line work is what people really like from me. And to me, I'm a bit baffled by it because I still am like, it's dead easy. Like I can make these for forever. And so I so but I finally started getting to the point now where I'm accepting it and embracing it. So um Oh, I put this in place. Okay. Here's me using it. So here's some, yeah. That's a question. Yes. So do you think, like, when you're saying, like, you're not, you're, it's taking you time to embrace the ease and stuff. Yeah. Is it kind of, do you think, like, the conditioning from art school and whatnot and the idea that it's always got to be hard mm. and a struggle and painful, like, trying to take blood? <laughs> right, right. And again, there's all those ideas of values and beliefs about labor, about artistic integrity, about excellence, right? About like, they can't be sh like soft and easy, but yet like if you look at Matisse and his cutouts, right? Like I love those things and they were just him cutting a paper in weird kind of funky shapes. And so it's, it's, and it, it's never, like you think that there's that idea that it's not enough or heavy, like the work's just sometimes, not. Sometimes, yeah. Like, that's, there's an idea about that. Yeah, like there's definitely like I know in the last year for me, like I finally went back to Canvas because when I moved, so I moved here about a year and a half ago from Kelowna. Um, it was like I need to make real paintings now, and then it took me like forever, and I kind of felt like I was just screwing around. And then I started making those engagement paintings, and feel like I've made those. I don't know if they'll go anywhere, if anyone will like them. So in the meanwhile, I'm making some bodies of work like this. So this, this is a collection called Trees. So every design is a collection of um, three interlocking shapes. So again, just simple rules. Okay, I picked my color, great. I picked my brush width, great. I'm gonna draw three shapes each time, boom, boom, boom. And I made like 20 or something of them and I think that they're lovely and meditative and seductive. And um, Especially right now, I'm really interested in the, in the idea of non-thinking because I am working in, you know, pretty pure abstraction um, where there isn't any representation. I am really interested in that my brain kind of, I've been doing this long now, uh, now that my brain kind of turns off, like my regular brain, and the other brain that speaks in line and color knows how to, like, put that next line to create these interesting kind of negative space shapes and, like, 
it just knows, I just know how to do this stuff, and it just kind of comes pouring out of me now, which is so fantastic. Um, this is one of the newest body of works. These are all quite small. Um, this is called the Stella Suite. Um, I remember many years ago um, looking at Frank Stella's black paintings, which were all paintings that were about taking the shape of the outside of the canvas and responding to it. So he just kind of traced it in until he got into the middle. And I remember seeing them in reproduction and thinking, oh, those are interesting. I remember seeing them in real life. And all of the rivulets, the white rivulets in between the lines were actually like, they're not computer crisp. They're really dry brush and they're really like rough and they don't look slick. And I'm, again, I'm really fascinated with that because it goes back to that wall painting stuff where I go, wow, the authority of line and how it works so magnificently. Like, I know that my head is not super steady here, but those white lines kind of lock that thing into a grid. And so it, it yeah, it, what am I trying to say? Like over, overrides any like shape of my hand because it just locks it. All right, so that's, so this is kind of the end of me talking about me and I just have a few kind of questions. So if there's anything you want to ask me about my work in particular, this would be the perfect time. If you want to ask any dirty details, yeah. I just wanted to comment, like I really like how you reclaimed your focus and direction away from the whole art school yeah. template because for anyone who's been to school, the, the discourse is, is so insane. Yeah. It has no relevance to the outside world. Yeah. Well, a small amount. When it actually comes to showing, selling, figuring out what it is that you want to do, it is very much about giving your power away to some authority who's written a book or a theory about what makes art yeah. good. And the political side of it, too, is so we deal with it many times. Completely sorry. Overwhelming at times, like with the political, like, you know, like you talk about Frank Stella, like yeah. the politics of representation, or when, at one point, did you decide that that just wasn't interesting to you anymore? Did you yeah. ever find that at all? So it took it took me a long time. Part of what worked for me was that I came I came back to the Okanagan from Ontario, and I kind of went, oh, I'm back in the Okanagan. No one knows what the fuck I'm doing. Like, I'm just a, like, I can just hide away. So I was kind of like, ha ha, I can do like whatever I want. But still, there was this hangover of all the rules that I had been taught, you know, which are both um, explicit and implicit, right? There's the ones that they tell you outright, and then there's the ones where you go, well, everyone is doing this like this. Guess I better do that too. Like, I remember my undergrad, one teacher telling me like, oh, she saw my work at like, I think some coffee shop or something, she's like, you don't show your work in coffee shops. Mm -mm. And like she, again, like the power of certain voices, right? In certain moments when they strike you. And I was like, oh God. Um, so it took many years to unpack. Um, and I've like, I feel like I've spent my whole time figuring that out. But then I'm also the kind of person who, I made a serious study of my own practice from the start. So like in my undergrad, I wrote an undergrad thesis because I was like, why did like why do I think lines are great? Like why? Why, why, why? <laughs> and then in grad school, you know, why do I think, why am I on about these things? Like you have to write that anyway in grad school. But um, I've just always been really like to me, why is the most fascinating question. Like whenever I was teaching, and especially with my four years, like it'd be so fun to be like, why are you making marks like that? And why are you always doing blue and why are you always doing yellow? You know, like those kinds of things. <laughs> This Scott always paints in yellow if you've seen his work. Um, yeah, so it's taken a long time. Um, and so, I, and part, so part of why the work that I do in my consulting practice with artists is geared this way is because we don't have set paths anymore of how artists can be. We have so many new tools and pathways. Like, I have a career that I never heard of before. Like, how I make my living, I had no idea it even existed, but it does. And so there's so many different ways to do things now, and there's so many different slices of art world, especially with like the space of Instagram. Like, you know, like we have some very successful artists here in Courtney, Comox, Cumberland, who have 50,000 followers who are doing really well. 
right? And all they need is that one conduit from coming in. So there's lots of different ways to do it. And so this is why I think it's paramount for artists now to ask themselves these kind of evaluative questions. So some questions like, what kind of artist are you trying to be? So like, you know, like write it out, like, you know, maybe like make it like a big caricature, like, oh, they only wear black. And they, <laughs> you know, they go to New York every spring for the art fairs and they blah, 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 you know, like those kinds of things. Who are you comparing yourself to? We've all got these ideas of how we're not measuring up. And usually if you're trying that you're not measuring up to something, you've chosen something or someone to measure yourself against. Um, do you actually believe what they believe? So like all these ideas that going to art school gives you, you know, that you kind of put on. I always see it as like putting on a jacket. And I feel like I tried to wear those jackets forever and ever, and I'm like, they never fit me. But God damn, have I tried so hard to do it. Um, and then actually, so then if you don't believe what they believe, what do you actually believe? Right? And this takes a lot of deep thinking. And I mean, in that kind of environment, you're not necessarily allowed to just believe what you want. No, there's, there's a because you gotta get a grade. Yes. Right? You gotta like you gotta jump through the hoop, right? Mm -hmm. So like one thing that I was thinking about would be honestly sit down and like what are all the ideas that you think about how how it is to be an artist? And you'll probably be kind of surprised of those ideas that you actually are holding in your head and you're trying to hold yourself accountable to. Um, and to me, like, like I was saying before, like the line between amateur and professional, I think is this line. Like if you haven't answered these questions, I don't really like, to me, you haven't done the work to make me really go like that. You have really like, you could be making like cartoon cat paintings, but if you like knew why you were making these little cat paintings, I would still be in love with you because you're like, oh my God, it's the pink. Here's everything that I'm thinking about the painting. Like here's how I apply that paint and like here's, like what the whiskers are about and like, great. Like if you're 100% invested, I'm there with you. But like, you know, it's just gonna keep seeing like, then maybe not, right? Um, so back again to our what, how, and why questions to apply again and why, how helpful they can be to you. Um, and also again, who do you make art for? Why do you make art? Is it about beauty? Is it about wisdom? Is it about play? Is it about surprise? Is it about mastery? Is it about materials? Um, and then again, how are you showing up in the world as an artist? You know, you've come to something like this. Have you gone and seen, you know, the shows that are going on around you? Because again, in my books, attention begets attention. So if you're going, why are people not, you know, coming to me? Why are my, why are opportunities not happening? Well, how are you paying attention to other people? Are you offering comments on Instagram? Like, this is really great, I really love blah, blah, blah. Or like, how are you showing up? How do you want your money to work? I think that every artist must sit down and, and talk to themselves about how they think that money works for themselves. Because I know when I sat down and did this, I thought that I had missed the whole starving artist mindset. Uh -huh. I had totally eaten it, swallowed it whole, but I didn't even know. And so it's taken me a long time to get over that as well. Um, so what motivates you and what are the values that drive your work? And this, this is going to change over time, right? That there's going to be different motivations at different times. Sometimes it is about like, oh my God, it's working the market. How do I keep this going? Or it's like, I'm really sick and tired of what I'm making. How do I make this exciting for myself again? Or I'm bored and how do I change direction? Um, so again, make, make a study of your own artistic practice. I think is really the most important thing of how, how to be an artist. You should be as fascinated with yourself as you are with everyone else. Um, yeah, oh yeah, so here's all the ways you can follow me. So here's my artist website, Facebook, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. Um, here are some of the things that I do in consulting. So I do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people um, online in person. Um, I also ask, answer, Questions for free every other Monday. You can just send them to me. So like that's a really great way for going, I just really need help with this one thing. Send me a question and I'll send out an answer every other week. And today, for everyone who's here who would like to leave their um, email with me, I'm offering $10 off any of my art consulting products. So if you want to you know, put your name in for that. 
some of the other things that I offer. So I offer the Art Licensing Roadmap. So this is where it's a four hour course. So it walks you through how art licensing works, all the like things that work for me, the things that I had to like figure out, that kind of thing. There's also a three, uh, free 30 minute preview on uh, toolsforartists.com. So that basically tells you what is art licensing and figuring out if it's right for you or not. Because for some people it's gonna work, for some people it's not. Um, I also have top three mistakes that artists make with their websites. You can watch the, the mistakes for free. <laughs> and then you can get the fixes for 35 bucks. And um, yeah, I look at lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of artist websites and some I go, yay! And some I go like, oh, oh God, okay. Please just do these three things. Um, and the new thing that's coming soon, so this is me challenging myself to do the next project. So this is gonna be um, exhibitions we're seeing. Um, oh, that bottom line <laughs> got totally cut off. So it's a curated uh, monthly newsletter list of uh, art exhibitions and events that are curated for all of Vancouver Island. So right now there is no resource that I can find that tells you from Victoria to Alert Bay what's going on. And I find that there's too much information there and, and my sense of Vancouver Island in general, everyone's afraid to have an opinion. Like everyone's like, we just love art. I go, great. But why like, so this is gonna be a curated list where I say like, here's the things, if you have an hour today, here's where I think you should go. Or like, you're gonna go to Victoria, here's the five shows I think you check out right now. So I think that will be um, a really fun resource. Um, thank you, thank you so much. We can continue to have discussion questions, but this is my email. You can hit me up at any time. Oh, <laughs>